Well, hello, everybody. I apologize for my absence today, but uh, we are going to do some um, learning about the causes of the revolution. I'm going to use the PowerPoint um, that you can find, uh, always find in the notes and PowerPoints folder. We are in unit two right now and causes of the revolution is the PowerPoint that we're going to use. So I'm going to download this. So today what we're going to what we're going to talk about is um, kind of looking at both sides the British government's perspective on taxation after the Amer uh, after the French and Indian War and the American colonists viewpoint on those very same taxes. Um, so let's get right to it. Um, so we're really looking at objective number three. Um, here we go. Um, objective number three on the PowerPoint. Evaluate the events leading to the revolution from both the colonists um, and the British perspective. And as each event you know, occurs, um, tensions are going to rise um, on both sides until eventually it explodes into war. So remember, after the French and Indian War, um, the British um, land claims in North America gets much, much, much larger, right? It's yellow over here. It's not that, that much land. And so they need money to pay for the defense of that land as well as to pay for the war that they had just fought against the French. Okay, so they feel like these acts are, um, these taxes are fair because um, it paid for a war for the colon on the colonists' behalf, and they needed to pay to defend the colonists. The colonists' perspective is that, um, according to philosophers like John Locke and English precedent with regard to government. Uh, like the Glorious Revolution, um, a government is tyrannical if it does not allow the people to have a say. And so um, their entire belief system about these taxes is that taxation without representation is tyranny, meaning they don't have a representative in parliament and therefore they should not have these regulations imposed by them by the British government. The British, of course, um, feel that uh, these taxes are necessary. They also argue this idea of virtual representation, meaning all members of parliament represent the best needs of all British subjects, no matter where they live. So they have a quite a different um, perspective. I'm going to skip that for now. So this Sugar Act was the first attempt after this 100-year period of salutary neglect um, to make some money from the, the, the British colonies. And since they had been left alone for so long, the colonists were not used to being regulated. They were not really happy about the Sugar Act. It was designed to prevent smuggling, so there was a crackdown on smuggling, um, and of course get people to buy British products, which actually lowered the tax on molasses. Um, however, um, any tax at this point uh, was not necessarily um, welcome considering the fact that they had been the colonists had been left alone for a hundred years um, if the colonists were upset about the sugar act then they were downright outraged about the stamp act that was imposed um, after the sugar act they begin organizing uh, the sons of liberty who the british government really looks at as a terrorist group um, become a really patriotic uh, group in the colonists, especially, really, this is happening, of course, um, mostly in New England. Um, the epicenter of this is in Boston. Sons of Liberty, including um, famous names like Sam Adams, John Hancock, Paul Revere. Um, they begin organizing large-scale boycotts, um, getting the word out through committees of correspondence, Paul Revere being one of those famous guys who rides through the colonies on horseback, um, delivering messages, ex explaining what's going on in Boston to the rest of the colonies. 
um, telling the rest of the colonists to boycott British products, meaning not to buy British goods. Um, but it all, it's also very violent. It gets very, very violent. Um, they begin, um, you know, throwing rocks through the windows of, of stamp collectors' homes, um, stealing money, picketing, protesting, and most of the violence, a lot of the violence happens with the tarring and feathering of these tax collectors, which um, was meant to humiliate them with the feathering, but was also extremely painful. I mean, they're pouring scalding hot tar over their um, their bodies after they strip their clothes off, which of course is going to lead to um, first degree burns. A lot of stamp collectors die from the from the wounds, and if they didn't die, they would be scarred for life. Um, this is not not you know um, innocent um, nonviolent protests. Let's put it that way. Um, so what was it about the Stamp Act that caused such outrage? If the Sugar Act um, led to some grumbling and some complaining, what was it about the Stamp Act that caused this outright crisis? Well, number one, it was the first direct tax. It was a tax paid at the time of purchase as opposed to um, at the time of shipment, at the time that, that the ships came um, came in from, from import on uh, at the docks. And this stamp was um, was found on all paper products, books, playing cards, newspapers, uh, legal documents, writing paper, anything that was made with paper had this stamp on it and you had to pay this tax. Um, it was also unlike the Sugar Act and the Molasses Act and the Navigation Acts that came before the Stamp Act, um, which were designed for trade regulations. This was the first tax designed to raise revenue, to raise money, as opposed to just regulating trade. Um, and you know, it was just really it was it was more of an obvious tax than prior taxes had been. And so, due to the fact that the boycotts were costing the British a lot of money due to the fact that um, much like anybody, if your, uh, your job is going to cost you your life or cost you, you know, um, your, your skin's going to fall off from being tarred and feathered, um, a lot of tax collectors just stopped doing their job, which is understandable. So this, the tax wasn't working. They weren't making money. British government wasn't making any money from it anyway. And so they decided to repeal or revoke or take back the, the tax, um, which of course kind of proves to the colonists that they can use mob violence to get what they want. Um, and it was also the first time that the colonists, um, the, co the 13 colonies, had united in any way, shape, or form. So it was quite a significant um, you know, moment, a significant turning point in this, um, this 10 years before the American Revolution. So the British government decides, well, if the direct tax um, was the was what caused them to have such a you know such a reaction then we'll just go back to an indirect tax the way we used to do it before um, which which they did with the Townsend Act um, it was a it was a tax on a lot of a lot of products um, but it was indirect it was not paid by individuals at the time of purchase it was paid at the time that the product was imported but at this point it didn't matter what kind of product or what kind of tax it was um, the, the colonists are still going to complain that without representation in Congress, um, I'm sorry, without representation in Parliament, um, any tax is not welcome. Taxation without representation is tyranny. And so the British um, government decides to send more troops over to enforce the Townsend Acts and maintain order. Um, eventually they decide to repeal the Townsend Acts um, because the the colonists were protesting even louder. Um, the colonial reaction to these red coats, which were sort of visual reminders that um, of, of this tyrannical British government was to taunt them, um, to, you know, to, to sort of egg them on, to try, try to, you know, cause them to, uh, cause the soldiers to um, attack them. Um, spitting, name calling, they would call them lobster backs because of their red coats. It was an insult. Um, and the tension just started to mount even higher. Um, remember that, you know, the colonists generally are feeling uh, a loss of freedom with the growing British control. And then to add insult to injury, the colonists were forced to house these British soldiers. 
Um, and if they couldn't find housing, uh, the British soldiers pitched troops on the tents in the common and, you know, just became overcrowded and smelly. And um, these troops weren't necessarily the most polite of all um, of all bunches either. Um, they were often young and experienced troops. Sometimes they were criminals that were allowed to get out of their sentence by coming over to the colonies because this was a job that nobody really wanted. They were the you know the lowest of the low in the chain of command in the British Army because it was so far away. Nobody wanted this job. Um, so you pit you pit those that kind of rabble rousers um, with the British redcoats against the rabble rousers in New England, and um, something is bound to happen. Um, and that happens on March 5th, 1770. It's a snowy winter evening. Crowds of Bostonians um, in the town squares, uh, in the town square gathered about 300, um, 300 to 400 men, depending on estimates um, that you read about, um, have gathered to protest the taxes and to protest what they think is a loss of jobs due to the British soldiers. The British soldiers were coming over and they were beginning to get side jobs to make a little extra money. And so um, the, the colonists were upset that the British soldiers were taking their jobs. And so they, they gathered a protest. The Sons of Liberty organizes this protest. And Sam Adams has sort of trained his mob um, to, to egg on the soldiers. He tells them to get right up to the bayonets, which are these these guys right here at the tips of the of the swords and let the bayonet prick them and that way they can yell the equivalent of police brutality um, and he you know he makes sure that they know how to how to provoke the redcoats um, and the the tension mounts to the point where um, violence eventually breaks out and when the um, when the smoke clears the British soldiers have fired their weapons into a crowd of unarmed, at least unarmed with guns, British, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, well, they were British, British colonists, um, American colonists, and five Americans ha are dead. Um, and this becomes a real rally point for the colonial um, point of view that the king really is a, a tyrant. Um, Paul Revere makes this drawing called the, and he calls it the bloody massacre perpetrated in King Street. Think about that word massacre, whose perspective this is from. A massacre implies um, innocence, um, that, you know, that this was a slaughtering of innocent civilians. Um, so I want you to, to just pause this right here and take a look at the worksheet uh, that is on this piece of propaganda. This was designed as many propaganda pieces are, to get people to view the king the way that the Sons of Liberty viewed the king, as a tyrant who would order his troops to, um, to open fire on a group of unarmed civilians. Um, so just pause this right now. Think about the fact that this is propaganda. It was, um, it was drawn up. It was copied. It was sent all over. Um, all over the colonies to try to drum up support for, um, you know, for the cause of, of freedom, for the cause of, you know, protesting the British tyranny. Um, and keep that in mind as you are evaluating um, the bias of this piece of art. Okay, so there's some questions on the worksheet. We're going to pause here and you can, um, you can come back in about seven minutes and we will move on from there. All right, so we're back, and um, hopefully, if you um, hopefully you were able to pick out the captain who is right in the back here. Um, and if I had to put a speech bubble um, on what the captain was saying, you would think that he was probably saying something like attack or fire. Um, you know, something like that. So that's supposed to be an exclamation point, not a, not a question mark. It's not fire. It's fire. Okay. So, um, obviously you can see that, um, that he is in the back. That's important. He's behind his soldiers. Um, the soldiers are, um, it's very clear that the soldiers are firing here. They are all over on one side. 
if you you know if you if you noticed hopefully when you look at the colonists they appear to be sort of backing up to be running away from um, from the soldiers and interestingly enough Paul Revere left out the fact that this was a snowy evening um, and probably I'm thinking um, due to the fact that that would just um, you know lend to the fact that it was a lot more chaotic than maybe Paul Revere would have wanted you to believe right he wants you to believe that this was a clear-cut um, you know massacre uh, which isn't exactly how it went down. So this next picture, this next picture is probably more along the lines of what it looked like. Um, this picture was done by an American painter named Alonzo Chapel, and he did this in, about a hundred years after the Boston Massacre. So there weren't the same sort of feelings of anger and resentment um, of this artist as there was. Um, of Paul Revere in this last painting. Um, actually, it was an engraving, but um, if you can't tell the, you can see it more clearly in this, in this image, the captain is right here. Okay, so there's Captain Preston. Um, so certainly a different account, visual account of what happened. Um, on March 5th, 1770. So let's take another seven minutes here and you can answer the question, um, the questions on the worksheet about Alonzo Chapel's painting. And you can pause, um, if you could pause the, uh, the video at this point and take about seven minutes to answer the questions. All right, welcome back. Uh, so um, we're going to end there for the day with a PowerPoint. And as a review, I just um, want to share this video. What caused the American Revolution? Like many disputes, this one began over two things, money and respect. It all started in the 1760s, when the British government needed to pay for the French and Indian Wars and turned to the colonies for cash. The first thing they did was require the colonists to buy heavily taxed British goods like sugar. Americans used sugar to make rum. This was one of the major products of the American economy. And when it became clear that this rum was going to be more expensive, the Americans objected. They wanted their cheap booze. Parliament said, okay, we get it, and eventually repealed the Sugar Act in 1766, but continued to impose other taxes. In 1765, the government issued the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act seemed like an even bigger deal than the Sugar Act. The Stamp Act said that legal documents, almost anything on paper, pamphlets, newspapers, playing cards, all of those things needed to have an official stamp that you had to pay for. To get a stamp, the colonists had to pay a collector. They weren't happy about that. You really didn't want to be a stamp collector at this point in American history. All the hatred was taken out on them. They had their houses attacked, they had rocks thrown at their windows. The Stamp Act was eventually repealed, but in 1767, the British tried again with the Townsend Act, taxing essential imports like paper, glass, and tea. The Townsend Acts were more taxes. The Americans figured we got rid of the Stamp Act by protest. We'll get rid of the Townsend Act by protest as well. The British repealed the Townsend Acts, though they did pass something new. A tea act, which gave their own tea merchants a big advantage in the colonial marketplace. We all know how that ended. On December 16, 1773, the colonists dumped 90,000 pounds of tea into Boston Harbor. The British were not happy, pushing back with laws designed to show just who was boss. The colonists hated these, calling them the intolerable acts. One, the quartering act forced colonists to get British soldiers food and bedding. 
the British figured that they were going to make a state. We are the people who run this place, not you. Place, not you. The Quartering Act, the other intolerable act, was really a test of strength to see who is stronger, who is going to govern in America. The British said it's us, and the Americans increasingly said, no, it's not. The intolerable acts actually helped to spark something of an American us at a really critical early point of what comes to be the American Revolution. On April 19, 1775, us versus them became reality as the American Revolution began with a shot heard round the world at Lexington Helen. Okay, so to end the day, um, we are going to go to the planner and look at... Um, Sorry, go to the assignments folder. And we're going to work on the rest of the uh, worksheet that you were working on earlier. Um, so you're going to need textbooks. Um, you're going to look at page 107 of the textbook. Um, as tensions continued to rise in the colonies, uh, there were many, many, many people, uh, especially in New England, who felt that um, some further action needed to be taken and eventually they decided that that further action was to declare independence. Um, but there were many people um, who wanted to stay part of Great Britain. Those people were called Loyalists or Tories. They were also called Tories. Um, and they, for various reasons, did not want to break away from Great Britain, did not want to declare independence. Um, so you're going to use the primary source on page 107, the two primary sources um, on that page uh, to just summarize uh, the reasons given by each side, the patriots, those who wanted to rebel, and the loyalists, those who wanted to stay um, loyal to Great Britain. Again, that's on page 107. This worksheet will be collected for a grade at the end of the period, and I will see you tomorrow.